to your liking. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, like, um, I remember uh, when I was first uh, teaching, I don't do that anymore, but I remember, yeah. No, uh, there's, a, there's another service after this. Um, so you can have the rest after the end of the se second service. Um, but I remember when I was first teaching, um, you know, and uh, you know, my student comes in and they would be like super sleepy. And so then, you know, um, for subsequent classes, I would bring along like candy, hard candy. And I would just give it out to them. And as soon as they eat the candy with the sugar rushing in, they're like wide awake. And so this is my attempt at keeping you awake this morning as well. <laughs> so let's go on to this topic because this is a very heavy topic. It's, um, I know like it may offend uh, some people, some of you. Um, and one of the things that is taking, uh, that I would hope that we will take away from this is that there are, there are times where we are not going to agree. There are times when um, we are not going to be able to see eye to eye on, on things. And we may walk away from the argument, but um, I, I do hope that you know, we're walking away from the argument, agree to disagree, but able to stay relatively friendly with each other afterward. Um, that's one of the things. But, um, so this message here is kind of heavy with a lot of history. And um, so here, endurance, um, I share a part of this with the Vietnamese congregation already, so I'm trying to condense two messages into one. And, um, and I hope that you know, I, I would be able to do that. So let's start. Um, endurance, uh, here's an image that is in the uh, uh, newspaper many, many years ago um, at uh, around 1896, 97, something like that. And here, we see that uh, President McKinley, president, the 25th president of the United States, is measuring what is Uncle Sam representing the United States. And you can't really see it very well, but on his pants are all the states, all the territory that is being added to the country. Uh, we'll go into the uh, political cartoon in a little bit and talk about a little bit more about the significance of it. But the title of the message today is about endurance. What does that mean? Um, endurance in English has two different connotations. On one side, it is positive. On the other side, it is negative. For example, when you read through a newspaper, um, former President Trump endured multiple assassination attempts, for example. In that particular connotation, that's negative. Or you read about the, um, the Olympic uh, marathon runner. She's a distance runner, obviously, from um, Uganda. And she was killed by her boyfriend, who threw accelerant on her and lit her on fire. She died three days later, and then he died. Some arguments causes people to just ex go to some extreme where they just want to, something to end, the, the, the argument to end, and um, whatever the discourse may be. Um, and so here, I'm just talking about endurance in the light of many, many different things that has gone on in the world. For example, there was a trial of a, a couple who owned a couple of dogs. And what had happened is that the dogs had gone out of the yard because it wasn't very secure very well. And the dogs actually attacked uh, a couple. The man was, I think, in his 80s. The wife was in her 70s. Um, the husband tried to protect his wife. The dog killed him and maimed her. She could no longer walk. Uh, and uh, one of the, during this trial, they were talking about how the couple, the husband particularly, tried to get the animal to be even more vicious than they needed to be um, by feeding them raw meat. And so that, uh, you know, essentially got the dogs to kind of favor the taste. Um, and what was interesting during the trial is that, you know, they, they talk about how he had come home look at the dogs and said, oh, there's blood on them. Um, uh, sort of like a point of pride, maybe, that uh, they uh, became much more vicious than just simply house dogs. But again, all these things plays out. And in the back of my mind, I want to think about the discourse about the, the varying dark argument that we have within our society within this time, particularly with Christians, which think about how uh, you know we 
as Christians, believer in the word of Jesus, uh, how do we approach arguments? And what is the end of all the discourses that we have? What is it that we want to happen at the very end? What endured? Um, what is the things that we want to come out of it? What will endure out of all of the arguments and the disagreements and things like the discourse that we have in our lives? So Matthew 4, 1 through 11 really gives us an image of the arguments, the discourse, and then gives us sort of the takeaway from Jesus' uh, perspective. So let me, let me, I know this is a very long uh, <laughs> introduction. William McKinley uh, 25th president of the United States, uh, elected um, twice, 1896-1900. Uh, uh, he was assassinated on uh, September 6th, uh, 1901. Uh, so the anniversary of his uh, assassination was several weeks away uh, ago. Um, and after, because you know, we have had, when I shared this message with the Vietnamese congregation, it was right after the first assassination attempt of former President Trump, and now I'm resharing this and after the second assassination attempt, so I'm hoping there won't be a third one. Um, uh, and you know, I, I laugh about it, but it, it, it's quite serious. So we've heard also in the news a lot about the Secret Service started in 1865 as an agency that actually investigate counterfeit money in the United States during that time. And it was after President McKinley's assassination that it took on the responsibility to protect the president. And then in 1906, it formalized, became the protective details of all government officials. And so um, we see the progression here. And you can see the year 1906 and 1907 comes back many, many, many times uh, in, in this introduction. Federal Bureau, um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI as we know it, Again, uh, 1908 formally became the, uh, the Bureau of Investiga Investigation, BOI, initially, and then later on becomes the FBI. But it also came out of this uh, assassinations of McKinley. As a response to interstate crime, there were a lot of um, uh, organized crime during the, the turn of the century, and so there were uh, local law enforcement had a hard time tracking down and prosecute a lot of the crimes. So this came out of that along with the um, assassination of McKinley because um, what they had wanted to do was to find the root cause of why someone would want to kill him. There was an anarchist who um, assassinated McKinley, and uh, they wanted to understand how deep, uh, deeply rooted this mentality was. And we'll go into some of the reason as to why his assassination um, occurred. Um, but um, in 1906, again, another, uh, so everything after 1901, obviously, is in the administration of his successor, which is Woodrow Wilson. Um, no, that's 27, uh, of um, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. So a lot of these things happened during Roosevelt administration because there were so many things that went on before and things that continued to happen during his time as president that he's, he felt compelled to, um, to go and help the country move forward. I'm not saying positive or negative in one way or another. This is just me retelling history um, during the 1900. Uh, and by 1930, what used to be the Bureau of Chemistry, which was organized in um, the mid 1850s, 1850s or so, um, really took on this Act of Pure Food, Drug, Meat Inspection Act and became the enforcement part of it. In 1930, the Bureau of Chemistry became the FDA Today, which is um, a significant organization within the US in terms of regulating a lot of the drugs that we are or are not allowed to take. With the issues of uh, abortion, for example, involve also the FDA, uh, you know, um, obesity, uh, a lot of things that involves us uh, day to day in terms of our health involves the FDA. So again, I just wanted to point this out, the history of how these organizations form. 
And then one of the things that we enjoy today is the Antiquity Act. We, you, you wouldn't think about it that way, but in 1906, Roosevelt passed or signed into law uh, this Antiquity Act, which gave President the power to designate anything as a national monument. And so uh, Roosevelt and subsequent President assigned a lot of the land to become national parks that we enjoy today, including uh, Yosemite. Um, so here I just wanted to go back and take a look at the reason why um, McKinley was assassinated. During this particular period of time, government in general, the federal government in general, favor business owners and a lot of the industries because of the expansion of the country westward and also throughout the world. And we'll talk about this expansion. This is a mentality that really drove um, the US um, government um, toward expanding throughout the world. And it's very, it took on a very um, almost uh, evangelical Christian uh, sort of like under girth, that sort of mentality. So during this, um, sorry, the, the bullet point sort of flipped here. There were a lot of, during, um, uh, Roosevelt's administration, he was thinking more in terms of are there progressive reforms that can be done to help the working class, to help the laborers, and uh, advocating for the labor rights? For, so for the very first time, a president actually stood out and, um, and actually uh, sort of uh, mediated the, um, the struggles between the working class and the owners um, in this strike, uh, the coal strike of uh, 1902. Uh, when um, Roosevelt became president. And this is the very first time where you really t think about the working class being favored by the government, that is being protected by the government. And so uh, again, there's, there is uh, a struggle within the American society because there is this westward expansion. Um, and the Spanish-American War happened in, uh, I think, 1898. Uh, around February, uh, let me see, okay, so US, USS um, Maine exploded in um, uh, Havana, Cuba uh, in 18, uh, 1898, and it killed 266 uh, sailors during that period of time. I know this, the font is really small. News media, <laughs> as it is today, sometimes exaggerated a lot of the conditions in Cuba and also how the Spaniards um, dealt with the Cubans. Today, maybe there is reflections of that in terms of how we look at, you know, maybe Israel and the war that's going on there, or we're looking at Ukraine and, you know, the war that's going on there. And the question really is, are we being, you know, dragged along by the media selling us something that maybe isn't really the reality of the, um, of the issues on the ground? But during this period of time, news media really exaggerated a lot of the conditions. Um, and then this uh, event happened where U.S. soldiers, sailors actually died. And then there is also this, what is called the Manifest Destiny Doctrine, which was very prominent during that period of time, and not only during that time, but uh, continue to today. Manifest Destiny is essentially is saying that democracy is great and that every country in the world should try out democracy because it is a moral responsibility of the U.S. to spread this governmental um, sort of structure to everywhere in the world so that everybody can enjoy the, the prosperity and the, the, the greatness of America. There's also this sentiment of American exceptionalism that went on during this period of time, meaning that America is wonderful. Everybody should become like Americans. <laughs> and, and so uh, not only did uh, uh, you know, the U.S. expanded um, westward and incorporating Alaska and Hawaii and every other uh, and all these uh, um, regions to become a part of the U.S. Um, but during the Spanish-American War, um, the U.S. within a very short period of time, the war started in April 1898 and the war ended in December 1898. So eight months later, Spaniard lost. America won the war on two fronts, both in the Caribbean and also in the Pacific, because they went to war against the Spaniard, also in the Philippines. They won both fronts within eight months, ended it, took Guam um, and uh, the Philippines, and also um, Puerto Rico. Now, I can go through a lot of other tangents here, but I won't. 
One of the greatest importance of the reason why uh, I think uh, America wanted to go on this war is because of sugar, carbohydrates. The very things that we're still talking about today in terms of diabetes and obesity and things like that. Sugar was one of the uh, main crops during that period of time, and Cuba had a large plantation, many, many plantations. There's a lot of interest in the export and import of sugar during that period of time, not only in Cuba, but also in Hawaii. Uh, right, continue to be um, um, the same today. So there's an economic parameter to all of this, and that is that interest in this economic component of Cuba and Hawaii. That's why this war occur, and that's why all of the propaganda happened, is because there's this particular uh, economic interest. And so here, um, you see McKinley here, you see Uncle Sam, you see a bunch of guys walking through the doors, and what they want to prescribe to the U.S. is anti-expansion policy. Today, we're talking about, and for the last couple, couple of weeks in the, in the message, we're talking about how much we're just taking on so many things. We just want to own things. We want to have things. And America, as a country, was expanding, wanted to get more and more territory, more influence, not only in the, conti uh, in the contiguous um, North America, but now expanding into Hawaii and Alaska and so on and so forth, getting Guam and um, the Philippines. And so people during this period of time just wanted to, 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 to there are some camp that said, let's stop expanding. Let's take care of what we have. Let's take care of what it is that is in America or in the U.S. And so Manifest Destiny really is this idea that because we're so great, because we're so powerful, because we can take over a war within eight months, winning it on multiple fronts, that we have this sort of, uh, this sort of like God-given right to keep on expanding, to keep on moving and influencing every single region within the world. And um, before 1898, for example, United States only had 38 states in the U.S. From 1889 to uh, roughly about eight years later, U.S. has 45 states. That's the kind of expansion that people were really concerned about because all of this expansion required a lot of steel, a lot of worker, a lot of manufacturing to keep on manufacturing ships, to lay down the railroads so that the country can expand westward and bring all the trade routes across um, the country. Uh, and to keep the economic engine moving. Um, and I just want to point out something that happened recently that also happened during this period of time, the precursor of it. Oklahoma actually became the 45th, 46th states in the Union in 1907. This is important because um, it happened under Roosevelt that Oklahoma became uh, the state. But recently, in the year 2000, uh, the Supreme Court reversed the decision um, that Oklahoma is, you know, entirely a, a U.S. state by returning the eastern half of Oklahoma to the native tribes. And the reason why this happened is because there were seven treaties that the U.S. government signed between 1830 and 1867 that essentially guarantee that that region of land be belongs to the native tribes, the Cherokee and the Creek and so on and so forth. This is important because endurance speaks to what is it that has been done does not mean that it continues to exist as such. We can think about it as Oklahoma is a United States state. How can it be returned to tribal land? What does that look like? What does that even mean that now Native Americans have this land as tribal territory. What does it mean? Well, it doesn't really mean very much. In reality, it simply means that, you know, crimes committed on that land is, whose authority is it to essentially prosecute the cases? That's essentially what it means. It still is in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is still the law of the land there. But um, there are some, uh, you know, nuances in terms of how to prosecute cases. In, in 2022, the Supreme Court issued another law that essentially reversed the original uh, ruling in 2020, which is kind of funny. But again, um, here we're talking about several different things, arguments. 
we always have these arguments about what, is, what should be done, what is right, what ought to um, happen, and so on and so forth. And whoever wins the argument, of course, they feel happy. And when they lose the argument, of course, they're not going to feel so good. Um, but what is enduring? What will come out of it? What is the sentiment? How does it set us on a footing for us to move forward into the future? Labor disputes during the turn of the century really is what ultimately caused McKinley to be assassinated. Now, he was a, a very popular president. A lot of people loved him, obviously. Um, but again, there are people who didn't, and that's why he got killed. Uh, Pullman strike in 1894, this is slightly a, uh, a little bit before his administration in uh, 1896. Uh, railroad workers strike because their wage was cut, because of high rents that they had to deal with. Today, we're again, we're reflecting on that and say, we're not getting our wages cut, obviously, but the inflation is so high that our money just doesn't get very far. So in essence, we, get, we are getting wage cut. And in California, our rent is high. <laughs> and so um, there is somewhat of a parallel here uh, between um, what happened during that period of time and now. Now, again, railroad is very important during that period of time because all of transportation, mail, uh, deliveries, everything. You think about Amazon during that period of time, parties, you know, occur by railway. Um, and then there is an anthracite coal strike in 1902. Um, coal miner in Pennsylvania strike because they wanted better wages and for better working conditions, not unlike what's happening today. In Pennsylvania, there is U.S. Steel, that is, uh, that they want to be sold to Japan, right? But um, the government is now blocking it because the workers there does not want this to go through. And I don't know how familiar you guys with that particular case or the cases that are being put forward, what is right, what is wrong. A lot of people have different arguments as to what need to be done. Before this, before uh, Roosevelt became president, again, um, federal government really sided mostly with business owners, with the business interests, and not with the labor. But when uh, Roosevelt came to power, he saw that, um, I don't know what he fought, saw. I don't know what he felt. I don't know what he experienced. But he took the side of the worker and began to put in place some of the things that became now unions. Um, he's Republican, so <laughs> it seems odd um, if we were to take a look at history in that particular light. Um, one of the messages recently by um, Pastor Nghe, he talked about sheep and commas. Again, the Psalm 23 came up many, many times. One of the things that I struggle with is that perhaps a lot of times when I think about being sheep, I'm like, I'm not a sheep. No, most of us are not sheep. We are intelligent thinking individuals. Um, we don't do stupid stuff all the time, <laughs> right? We're not mindless. Sheep can't help being who they are. And shepherd cannot change who they are, right? And passing year gave this illustration about sheep and how the shepherd has to go and really clear these fields of the white commas, which are shown on the left there, and versus the blue commas, which are shown on the right. Um, blue commas, these are like onions. People. Pl Take them, not the, the white commas, by the way. White commas are called death commas. It is poisonous to everything, virtually everything. Nothing except one thing is not poisonous to that thing, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Commas can't help being who they are. They can't decide one day that I'm going to be blue, I'm going to be white. They are distinct species. And if you look at them, they look very, very similar. And if you look at the middle picture, they are growing side by side. There is no shepherd in this world that's going to go and pick up all the white commas and get rid of them. Where are they going to put them? Where are they going to throw them? The only way that they're going to keep the sheep safe is by not letting them into that field to begin with, right? One of the things where we're looking at it, and I think that, you know, for me, I look at it and I said, this, you know that they're white versus blue because there are flowers. When they're not in bloom, you can't tell the difference. You plug them up, and you look at the bulb, and they're not different. The only way that you would be able to tell the blue versus the white, the one that will kill you versus the one that doesn't kill you, is by smelling them. <laughs> That's how they do it. That's how the Native Americans did it. They pluck them all up, 
and smell it. If it smells like onion, you can eat it. If it doesn't smell like onion, you need to get rid of it because it's going to kill you. And again, there are things that we can help and there are things that we cannot help. The experience that you have gone through, the things that you have lived through, the things that formulates in your mind what it is that you will agree with and not agree with, you cannot change that. It becomes a part of your experience. Whether you like the chocolate over here or over there, I cannot, help, I cannot say anything to convince you to like it. If you don't like it, you don't like it. If you like it, I cannot say anything to make you dislike it. I was on, uh, you know, I, was for, I, I am for very fortunate to have traveled the world for work, um, not paying for anything <laughs> in my experience. But one of the things that uh, really stood out in my memory was a trip to Japan where they, they serve this 15 course meal, amazing food, er, er, you know, all the way through. And the very last course is this white thing that is on a dish. It's very small. And they said, this is the absolute delicacy. And you, are, you came just in time to experience this because it doesn't, you know, they don't always have it. And after I've eaten it, I was like, mm, this is kind of not my thing. It's kind of slimy. And it turns out to be fish semen. Um, you know, so I was like, I can't tell you what it tastes like. Maybe you will like it, but I don't. Obviously, a lot of people in Japan likes it. It's their delicacy. They pay a lot of money to eat this. I don't know why. I wouldn't. Again, there's nothing that, you know, my experience tells me I'm not going to do it again that I, now that I know. Well, of course, they never tell you before you eat it. They only tell you after you eat it. So the gag reflex is all in full motion, right? And so they're like, just, just drink, drink a lot of sake. You'll be fine. Um, so um, the experiences that we have, the things that have brought us up, the things that we read, the things that we memorize, the things that ingrain into our mind like that in one experience, right, really tells us, really informs us of what kind of decisions, what we will like and what we just dislike. And in this particular case, there's only one, <laughs> you know, animal that really survives this. It's called the death commas um, bee. They actually can get into the flower, get the pollen, not sure if they, they eat it. The one fortunate thing is that these bees do not make honey. So you don't have to worry about eating the honey. <laughs> they, they're the minor bees. They, they, you know, they don't make honey. So there's no worry that we're going to eat um, the honey and die. So each of us, kind of like this bee, have a very unique experience that informs us of what it is that we will tolerate and what it is that we cannot. A lot of us were like, oh, let's just start eating white commas and see we'll die. You will die. There's, there's no doubt about that. I think Pastor Paul was also sharing about you know, how it is interesting that we eat dead stuff. We only eat dead stuff to keep being alive. But I think that that is one of the quintessential part of uh, why it is so difficult to understand um, what life is. Because obviously we eat sugar. Sugar is not alive. It's, it's not dead either. It's just a thing. But we need it for our brain. And we eat many, many different things. Vegetables, are they alive? Are they dead? I'm not really sure. Um, one of the most more recent studies that came out says that for, uh, I just wanted to clarify this point here. When you are an organ transplant uh, acceptor, when someone gave you their organ, they obviously are dead, right? But their organ is alive in you, right? Huh? I have two kidneys? Yes, yes. Yes, you can live with one kidney, yes. And m more recently, they took some lung cells, and we all know this, they took some lung cells, and if you just leave that lung cells in media, it will keep on proliferating. Even though the person has already died, your cells continue to thrive on and live on. But um, so this definition of life and death, again, going back to the argument about abortion, when can abortion happen or not happen, and so on and so forth, when does life begin, and so on and so forth, it is, to me, in my mind, nuance. It's not clear cut. I, I, I just want to 
be able to articulate that. And you know, we can have the arguments, we can have all these discussions, but I don't think that, you know, again, we're gonna be able to see eye to eye based on what I experienced, based on what you experienced. If we have a disagreement there, we're not going to come to a conclusion, aha, I now I understand you. No, these discourses will happen and continue to rage for generations to come. Matthew 4, 1, I'm sorry for a very long intro, but let me get to, into this. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Now, there are three things here that are important. Uh, led by, meaning that he did not actively, he was passively being brought into the situation, uh, into the wilderness where there is no one else around. There is no one else experiencing this, this exact temptation that Jesus is going through. And he is being tempted. Here, the, the word in Greek is uh, pizza, uh, pirazo, uh, to prove, to examine, to test, to ascertain, to really tr get to the bottom of who he is, to get to the bottom of who Jesus is. After 40, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now, um, who told him to fast? I don't know. It is not written. I don't know why he fasted. Maybe he just felt like, I need to make this really hard. I need to, <laughs> this, hard, this test is too easy. Have you ever met people like that? This test is too easy. This weight here that I'm lifting is too easy. I need to add more, I need to add more weight. Or this swim here is too short. I need to add a couple more laps. Or this run here is too short. I need to add a couple of 10 miles. Something like that. It's too easy, maybe. I don't know. He was hungry. He was hungry. So um, here, the, the word hungry here is, again, just like Pastor Paul shared, from Philippians 4.12, where Paul was saying, I know what it is to be lacking. And it is the same work, but in uh, the Bible, in, uh, in Philippians 4.12, in that particular instance, it says, I know what it is to be in need. Here, Jesus is in hunger. It really is craving or seeking to satisfy a particular desire. Now, you and I, every day, will have these sort of desires. Maybe you don't. But... There is a desire to ask the question, how do we get peace in the world? How do we end hunger in the world? There are questions that we cannot wrap our mind around because we're, there is no answers. Maybe it bothers you, maybe it doesn't. There, maybe there are struggles that you have that no one else can understand. You are hungry about something. Maybe it's not about food. Maybe it's about something else. The tempter came to him and said, if you are a son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now I want to, it, it's very interesting here because Jesus probably looked at Satan and said, are you insane? I just fasted for 40 days. I can't eat bread right now. It's going to give me stomach upset. My stomach shrunk to, to nothingness. And, you know, if I eat something like bread, which has high glycemic index, it's going to make me really, really in pain. I need to get something like, car uh, like low glycemic carb like bean or you know like vegetables or m most likely i need like coconut water right a lot <laughs> you read on any forum that talks about fasting for you know more than 20 days they really say you need to go and drink a lot of water or coconut water you know eat drink some soup you know get your body back up again you know you shouldn't go for for carb right away so jesus is looking at saying said you're insane I want to go get myself some soup, man. Like, you know, like some miso soup or something. Something light. No, he's, you know, um, bread. You know, it, it, it's interesting because no, no one who fasted for 40 days will go out and eat bread right away. So Jesus is saying here, it is written. What is it that I really believe in in this moment? Because even Satan at that point can convince him to eat bread. He's dedicated to his cause. There are a lot of people who are dedicated to their cause, and there is nothing that you can say to change their mind. There are two forces here that are arguing against each other. And I just want to highlight the word, it is written. Because in the subsequent verse here, if you are a son of God, Satan said, throw yourself down, for it is also written. Right? Here, you always hear these things in every argument. Isn't this what is also written? Didn't the Bible also say this? Isn't that particular finding also said this? There are always nuances with everything being written. You can always find something to back up your cause. The argument is never like it's clear cut here, this part here says this, 
And then people always say, what about this? What about that? The argument never ends because there is something so concrete that you can absolutely say without any doubt that someone won the argument. Last presidential debate, someone said, some people said, you know, one person won. A lot of other people said the other person won. The country is divided 50-50 between who ought to be the president. There is no argument to be had <laughs> where you say definitively this person ought to be the next president. It's difficult. It's hard. You cannot convince someone who have already set up their mind. There's nothing here as difficult as it is. And I believe it is a difficult trial that Jesus went through. It must be difficult or else it is not a trial. And they have these arguments between Jesus and Satan. I want to also point it back that, you know, a couple of verses at the very beginning of this, and this is important too, is that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. This setup here was done. These two individuals came into the wilderness it was a setup that someone had already formed. God ordained this moment to happen. It wasn't as if the devil went to Jesus and said, hey, you want to go hang out in the wilderness? Right? <laughs> that didn't happen. It happened because God ordained this moment. Why was it written this, in this particular way? Why is it important for you and I to read about this today? In the middle of all the arguments that we have had, in the middle of everything that we are struggling with, have you ever won an argument by convincing the other person that they're wrong and you're right? <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> Most of the time what we do is that we just say, let's agree to disagree because I'm hungry or I'm tired or I'm sleepy or whatever, something like that. I've never ever been a part of an argument, a passionate argument, where I believe in something and I'm able to convince the other person otherwise. But well, how do you walk out of that? Can I convince you that this chocolate is good? Can I convince you that because the box is yellow and somehow it's good in, on the inside, it's melted, you say. I can't enjoy it because it's all messed up, right? Whatever it is, there is always something that you either like or dislike and I can't convince you otherwise. The story here, um, and I just wanted to go to the very last part here. The devil took him to a, play, to a very high mountain, show him all the kingdoms and all their splendor. All of this I will give you if you will bow down and worship me. I think this is kind of significant. Because I think that this is a test. And it was difficult for Jesus to say otherwise. He got angry after this. Away from me, Satan. He obviously felt strongly about this. For it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Something about taking him up to the top of the mountain and telling him that I'll give you all this. Now, if you think about it, does the world belong to Satan? Is it his domain to give to Jesus? Is it that Jesus is angry because he's like, you don't even own this. How can you give me something you don't own? Or is it, is it because Jesus is saying to himself, I have the solution. And if it is within my power, I would be able to fix all of this. Isn't it in every single one of our mind ask the question, if God is so powerful, if Jesus is so good, why is there are so many problems in the world? Why didn't he solve all of this? Why do we continue to have wars and struggles and famines and issues like dogs killing an elderly couples? Why do we continue to have people who doesn't care about what goes on in the world, about how many babies get killed, how many pregnant women had to die? for whatever reason. Why a law pass or not pass that help or hurt individuals around us? If only I was in power, I have the solution. If only everybody would listen to me, I have the solution. 
Jesus definitely is that guy who, who would have the solution. Right? He would. And I think that that is the struggle. I think that is the trial that he does have in his mind how to fix all of this if only he is given that task. A lot of us today, many of us would say, I have the solution. I think I know what needs to be done. If we were to look back at the history, how many people said that they have the solution? They brought it forward, and today we live with consequences. How great were those decisions? How magnificent were those things that they had done? What endured? What is written? What has now remained? How has it changed? How has it not changed? Jesus gave us, for me, something that is fundamental. What is impressed upon my heart? What is enduring on my heart? In the moments where I struggle the most, what gets me to move on to the next step? What is it written on your heart? Is it forgiveness? Is it anger? Is it retribution? Is it empathy, sympathy? What is written on your heart? What has the word of God impressed most on your heart? What is it written there? Not what is it written in some book somewhere. For it is written, and I believe what Jesus is saying as implied here, for it is written on my heart. Worship the Lord your God and serve him. Because the devil also points to something that is written in the Bible. Something that also is written and can be argued about. But what is it written on your heart today? I've read through a lot of court cases about abuse, about the injustice. In every single case, after the closure of that particular case, when the verdict is read, family members are also having a chance to talk about how that impacts them. How each one of these cases either bring closure or not closure. Right? What impresses upon your heart? Formulates prior to the cases actually argued. Prior to the result of those cases, actually won or lost. What is written on your heart does not get changed by what happened by the events that eventually happened. We're human <laughs> of a particular stripe, of a particular way of thinking. There is nothing that will be argued that would change your mind. There's nothing that I can give you evidence, give you some fruit to eat to change your mind. You are set. But the only question that is being asked today is, what is written on each one of our hearts? Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to learn, to study the events that have happened throughout history, Lord God, to inform us, Lord, what is currently written on our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to reflect and look deep within ourselves, Lord, and see which words have been inscribed upon our hearts? What has endured in our mind, Lord, through all the events that had happened to us, throughout our entire history of our lives, Lord? I pray that you would allow us to be reflective, to think of what, which word of yours has been ingrained in us, which has endured through the time with us, which has resonated with us. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to be informed of who we really are. Lord, allow us to see in the mirror the person who's looking back. 
to reflect and to understand that person clearly. I thank you, Lord. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.